Would you pray with me? And I wanna welcome everybody joining us online. Thanks for welcoming us into your home or wherever you're at right now. But I do believe the Lord's got a word for us today. And I just ask that we just be able to get everything he has for us. Father, in Jesus' name, it is your word that you send to heal us, to deliver us from all of our destructions. And Father, I pray the word of God will go forth unhindered today to every person under the sound of my voice and those that will hear it later. That Lord, you will watch over your word to perform it. And Father, may faith come and arise in every single heart, light that will shatter the darkness. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody says amen. amen. All right, let's take our Bibles out. We are talking right now about the glorious church. And if you weren't with us last week, you know that you can always go online and these are posted. So this is part two of the glorious church. And this message really started impacting me when I started studying for this. And we know this, go to Ephesians 5.26 because as dark as things are, people kind of wonder, what does the future hold? Well, I'll tell you this, the church, and by that I don't mean the institutional church, the body of Christ will not leave this earth crippled. It will not be limping out. We are going to leave a glorious church, according to the scripture, without spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. And all the shaking that's been going on has been causing things to be shaken in such a way so we will ultimately get to the place where that which cannot be shaken is all that remains. Ephesians 5, 26, so that he might sanctify it, cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself. A what? A glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without Blemish. So last week, one of the points that we talked about was this, the sifting, the refining, and the separation is taking place right now. The sifting, refining, and separation is taking place right now. How many of you since this corona thing broke out have felt that, that in, even in your own personal life, there's been sifting going on, refining going on, shaking? Then the Lord, I've reflected back on those five words the Lord gave us in February before all this stuff came. In fact, the Lord just dropped it so quick that I questioned it almost. I said, well, Lord, is that you or is that me? Because sometimes my studies affect, obviously, my thinking processes, which lead to other things. And all of a sudden, just out of, I say out of nowhere, but right like that, change, upheaval, shifting, redirecting, an increase. Those five words. And then all of a sudden, things began to unfold. And every day I saw all of those things. I saw change. I saw upheaval. I saw shifting and redirecting. And we saw increase. And we're still seeing all of these things. As we've gotten down the road, I see more and more how the Lord is working and I remember the one, you know, there's all these prophetic voices that God's raising up, is speaking through people never heard of. And one in particular said, back in January before anything, the Lord is dealing with his church right now, the church. And he said, everything that can be shaken will be shaken, and even the very ground you walk on will be shaken. And everybody's I think, I say everybody, I think most people just kind of want things to get back to normal. They want to, I just want to get back to normal. I just, and it's not coming. Because the Lord is preparing his bride, his body, to gather in, I believe, the great end time harvest. And so I want you to go to Jeremiah 17, verse 9, because this message today, it just, it's kind of riveting and it's I want to share with you how some things came about. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Most of you know this scripture. And there's so much to cover. But this is going to be a foundation. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart 
is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Some of your translations will say desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Okay. So he says the heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Some, some translations say incurably sick, desperately wicked. And you can say, well, I'm a born again believer, so my spirit has been made brand new. Exactly. All of us have, but we have a soul that consists of the mind, the will, and the emotions. That has to be renewed. And even a born again believer is capable of wicked things. Years ago, I went down with the prison ministry team. This is a long time ago. I think we were in the old building. And I went down to minister on one of the nights in the prison. Man, it was the most powerful time. It was the strongest anointing because they allowed ministers to come in. Yeah, I mean, you had to go through this. Is, these are the penitentiaries, not the jail now. So you had to get, you know, everything. We brought in musical instruments. Everything had to be checked. Not, a lot of stuff couldn't come in. But I got to tell you, that, that was powerful. The presence of God was so thick from those being in that room, I don't know how many guys, I'm guessing, maybe 20 or 30, because it was voluntary, we got our own room. The, the warden, uh, the guard, one of the guards, man, he was touched, he was impacted. The time went like that, nobody wanted to leave. It was so thick, and I will never forget, a man came up to me, he goes, hey, Pastor Mark, how are you? He goes, and he was on a staff of a church in this state, that Dr. Lester Summerall had been to. And he goes, I know he'd been to your church. I said, yeah. I said, you were, you were on so-and-so's staff? Yeah. I know him. He's a friend of mine. And when I found out what he was in for, it was literally, and I don't even want to say it, but it was beyond what I could fathom. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. And I hadn't thought of that for a long time. I hadn't thought about it till just now. But that, that, that underscores this, that the heart of even a born-again believer is capable of some unbelievable things. I guess we'd say it that way. So let's look at these three things. Number one, we believe the Lord is raising up a glorious church, which means it's going to be a church, if you will, not a building. The church is not the building. It's the people. You're the church. Individually and collectively, we are the body of Christ. What is the glorious church going to look like? What's it going to look like? I can guarantee you this, probably not what we're thinking. If there's one thing I've learned, everything God's done, everything he said he would do, and when he said he would do it, never came the way I thought it should. For some reason, the Lord just didn't check with me. And I wished he would have because I had it all figured out. Right? Have any of y'all ever had it all figured out? When it should happen? How it should happen? What it ought to look like? And many times it comes very different. Okay? Well, one thing we know, it's not going to have spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. It's going to have... It's going to have this blessing about it. And so there's several things here this morning. I just want to share my heart how this came about because this is important. This may be one of the most important things, what we talk about today, to be a part of what God is going to do in these last days. Because the enemy cannot stop you from what God has destined from you. He can only deceive. He can only deceive. Yeah and stumble up and trick up. He can't do anything you and I don't give him permission to do. Well, I would never give the devil permission to do anything. Oh, yes, we would. It's through disobedience. Denying the Lord, you know, the Bible talks about there's a group of people that will deny the Lord. That, that doesn't mean somebody's going to stand in a field, raise their fist to God. I reject you, Lord. I deny you. If you study what that means in the scriptures, when you disobey the Lord, that is denying the Lord. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Yes. So, so what does that mean? We're going to look at that. So the, 
The one thing that is going to be an earmark, we're going to come into the unity of the faith, yes. not the unity of doctrines. I didn't, man, this is, this is exciting for me. This is not work, okay? This is, I love this. This is part of the journey. I, I got to thinking about it that some of the pastors, brethren, if you will, I have a brother in Christ, and I've had people leave the church over what I'm about to tell you. I have a brother in Christ that is a Catholic priest, that I am more in the unity of the faith with him than some of my Pentecostal, spirit-filled, charismaniac, I mean charismatic, <laughs> word of faith brethren. I'm, I'm more in the unity of faith with him. I served on a board with a, a dear, dear Catholic priest, and when he prayed, the presence of God fell in that boardroom. And I started, the, the, I mean, it, it touched the deepest part of my heart. The anointing of God came in the room. I have more of the unity of faith with him, and yet we could not be more diametrically opposed on some doctrinal issues when you come to the Catholic faith. But there's a unity of the faith. We're never going to get into the unity of doctrine, teachings, all that kind of stuff. Never. But you will come into the unity of the faith. So we're going to come into this unity of faith and mature, which is grow up, what? Into him. How many of you know the Lord had to humble himself to deal with you and I, even to have a conversation with us? We were so darkened in our understanding. Have any of y'all ever gone through that where you look back where you were when you first gave your life to the Lord and it scares you? Oh, yes. You think, ah, oh, was I that darkened? Was I that in the dark and full of darkness? And yet the Lord humbled himself to deal with us. So now here's the deal. Let's shift gears because this, I want to tell you how this unfolded. Ivan Tate, I love and appreciate the revelation he has on forgiveness. And just trust me, Ivan in his stories had to walk it out. And you know some of the story about his father and and what happened in his upbringing and, and what have you. But he says this, when God is ready to promote you, he will send someone across your path to offend you that will surface the pride and vanity in your heart so he can raise you up in due season. What would happen if the Lord promoted you with offense in your heart? Everything gets magnified. It's like a person thinks money will fix their problems. Money won't fix your problems. It will magnify things, both the good and the bad. So what happens is there are people that have won the lottery, okay, and all of a sudden they went from barely being able to pay bills to a multi-gazillionaire, and then all of a sudden they followed many of these people, and those people ended up as much in debt, if not more, than they had ever had in their entire life. What did money do? It magnified what was already in there. So if a person is a selfish person, that will magnify the selfishness. But if they're a generous person, even in a poor state, money comes along, and then it will magnify. That's why the Bible is the best financial book you'll ever get. And that's why the Lord tells us to give right where we are. Don't wait till you get blessed, so to speak. He didn't take the widow's might when she dropped it in and said, wait, you come back here. I happen to know you just gave more than anybody here. Take your might back. No, he didn't go chase her down because that's the way we get blessed. Okay. So, so here's the thing. Let's go to number two. What is going to be an earmark? of this glorious church, and I believe this. Humility will be an earmark of the glorious church. Humility will be an earmark of the glorious church. We know this, the Lord humbled himself. Humility is a heavenly quality. Humility is a heavenly quality. Jesus could never have come from heaven if he didn't humbled him, humble himself. Jesus could have never completed his God-given assignment until he humbled himself. It says he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And what would have happened if Jesus hadn't died on the cross? We'd be lost for eternity. 
Now, was that fun? Was it pleasant? Was it delightful for him to humble himself? This probably, it was the most painful, trying thing. Never in his life was he ever tempted to get out of doing what God had called him to do. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. We talked about it last week. Gethsemane means oil press. The Gethsemane means that the olive, you can't get the oil out of the olive till you break the flesh. And he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. When you obey God, sometimes it is the most painful thing you ever do. And that can be in forgiving someone. I've had people over the years, this, this January will be 34 years as senior pastors. So I've seen a lot, but there's really nothing new under the sun. If I took all of the things that I've seen as a pastor, I could put it in a very thin notebook. The only thing changes is names, faces, and combinations. But one of the biggest things the devil will do to destroy a person's life is offend them, yes. hurt them. Because when you study offense from a scriptural standpoint, it means to snare. And with offense in a heart, unforgiveness in a heart, it's like getting a sore and it, and it gets infected and then it can build up. And, and like, uh, I remember what we take for granted, you know, medical care and things like that. I remember one of our Indian missionaries, there was a, a, a tribal group of Indians and a man hit his leg with an ax and they don't have simple sanitation. They don't have ways to cleanse wounds. They don't have sterile gauze and bandages. So he just wrapped a, a rag around it and he didn't clean the wound or anything like that. Things we take for granted. And that leg got so infected, it became uh, the gangrene set in. And then this missionary got him into a hospital that had to amputate his leg. Now, that wound, if it had been dressed properly, could have been taken care of and he could still have his leg today. There are things that happen to all of us that have the capacity, and Paul uses those things, used that very term. Um, he used like a gangrene, like a cancer sets in, and it literally, in the Greek, it's like that. A gangrene sets in the heart, and it gets very infected, and what could be dealt with can cause a lot of damage. It can actually take a life out. So, Jesus humbled himself. So here's the thing. What the Lord, I'm seeing the Lord do is unity is necessary for what the Lord's ready to do. He wants to bring the harvest in. He wants to allow the glory to come in the church. I have to tell you that I know he's working in my own heart because if he poured out the glory right now and the power There'd be a lot of dead people right now because Ananias and Sapphira, the glory was flowing and they had a little white lie, they call them. They just said, hey, look, you know, I know everybody's giving everything, but let's just sell this and, and then we'll just give a little bit of it. And then the word of knowledge kicked in and they walked in and Peter said uh, to Ananias, he said, did you sell the land for so-and-so? And he said, when that money, when you got that money, wasn't it yours to do what you wanted to do with? Yeah, it was. We said, why did you let who? Satan fill your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost. And he fell down dead. Woo, that didn't sound very Christ-like to me. That's what happens when the power of God comes in. The power and the glory of God is like your body's immune system. It attacks anything that threatens your well-being. And lying is one of those temp those those things that that the devil is behind so so unity what is going on right now there's and jesus warned us he said offenses are going to come how many's been offended lately how many's had the opportunity to get <laughs> okay true confessions here let me just share a little bit of my own life so our culture impact team great group of leaders uh they came in and one of them came in with this book, Unoffendable. This was a few weeks ago and uh, gave me a copy. I don't know if that was a big hint or what that was, but gave me a copy. No, it wasn't. It was just to say, this changed my life. And all of a sudden they started sharing things. 
And it says the subtitle, Just How One Change Can Make All of Life Better. Well, I have so many books to read. I wish I could speed read. I really do. But so Audible helps me, audible.com. I, got, I can listen to a book because I'm going to be driving anyway. So I went online to see because I, this book was sitting on my desk and then on my shelf and it kept vibrating. And then little hands came out and went. I then perceived I maybe should read this book. So I found it on audible.com and I thought, this is great. It's only a four hour book. Uh, so I'd started driving down the road and all of a sudden he starts talking about, you know, how easily we are offended. Somebody cuts us off in traffic. Guess what happened to me right about the time that he said that? And before I could think, before I could think, I was reacting. I had to give myself a C minus on that one. We should know better, right? We're programmed for offense. We've learned offense. And all of a sudden I started going through this and it obviously impacted, but the Lord was speaking through this to me that Mark, you got some work to do. And then I was in a drive through. Oh my God. I don't even want to tell you. It was like, not what I did, what the other person did. It was like, I was in disbelief. And I was sitting there and I got a, probably a C minus on that one too. I'm like, Mom, I'm going, I do not believe this just happened. And I'm listening to the book. It was on pause right then because I was talking to someone. But I thought, wow, Lord. And it reminds me of the first time years ago. Some of you know Dr. Locken, and, and he does these blood tests that when you go to get your blood drawn, because the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood, I had wanted to know because my primary care doctor would just do the standard routine, just a couple of things and look at it. But I knew that there were some things you could learn about what's going on in your fit. So anyway, I went to Dr. Locken and so I go down to get my blood drawn, and they need eight vials of blood. And the first thing the gal goes, what'd you do to make your doctor mad? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, with this naturopath stuff, you know, I just kind of want to learn what's going on. And I've heard about this. Finally found somebody who can do it for me. So I went in there, and I got, and we're sitting down, and we're going over everything. And then I walk out with this list of what they call nutraceuticals that I need to get. And I had this stuff going, and so I said, I feel great. I feel really good. You know, high energy and all that kind of, and he goes, you've got this, 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 and this. So I said, okay, well, I'm gonna order them. And I felt like I had six meals a day. I'd eat a meal and then a handful of these other things here. <laughs> so I would take those with each meal. About three days in, I thought I was going to die. I felt like I had been hit by a freight train and drugged down the track. It was like flu symptoms on steroids and just take me home, Jesus. <laughs> I felt horrible. I called them up and they said, back off, you are detoxing too fast. And I backed off, I was overworking everything in my body and that's your body giving you a signal, slow it down. And so over six weeks, I, I eased back into those, went in and looked at my blood results, and there was a radical difference on the inside. And I didn't even know anything was wrong in here. And that's the way the human heart is. Till you take high doses of the Word of God. Till you get some mega doses of the Word of God in your heart so light can come in. You think you do pretty good. Do you know, back to our scripture, Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all else. You can justify anything. All right, we ain't any gonna get anywhere near where we need to get, but let's do this. What are the signs of offense? Well, first off, here's what you need to know. Offense causes a great deal of damage in our hearts. It can lead to spiritual strokes and spiritual heart attacks. Can't tell you how many stories I've heard and people right in this church that had no warning. I've 
gotten phone calls. So-and-so died last night in their sleep. They call them widow makers. They never had the symptoms and they had a heart attack in their sleep. They went to bed and never woke up because they didn't know the condition of their physical heart. But here are some things that you need to understand. Hatred defined according to the scripture means to simply detest people. 1 John 3.15 said, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Wow! Do you know how that really reads if you took the Greek of it? He that detests his brother or sister in Christ is a murderer. James is one of these guys, the book of James, he just throws the meat of the word on the table and says, like it or lump it. There's no comfort with James. James was a brother of the Lord. He didn't receive the Lord until after he had resurrected from the dead. How do you live with God and not know it? James was the Lord's brother. He lived with him and didn't know and didn't even receive him till later. Murder is the root of hatred or detesting someone. Hatred is just the fruit. Hitler hated the Jews, yeah. and it digressed into full-blown murder beyond comprehension. Yeah. Hatred will create a defiled conscience. Look at Titus 1.15. Hatred creates a defiled conscience. Now, this is where we have to be careful because the Bible is supposed to cleanse our mind and wash out and all these. But Titus 1.15 says, To the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but their mind and their conscience is defiled. Now, listen, here's the key. Look at verse 16, they profess to know God, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. So let me give you as best we can in the remaining time, the picture of the offended heart. The picture of the offended heart is this, truth no longer matters. What is truth? Thy word, O Lord, is truth. I was with a dear pastor friend of mine. I love this pastor. He's been through some stuff and he has had to forgive. Serious stuff. Betrayal at levels you cannot imagine. And we were together just this week. And he was sitting with the pastor and they were talking about things. And he was asking him about a few things. And he goes, brother, how can you take that position? The word says, and here, this is a quote. He said, you offend me that you would try to put your convictions on me. Well, there is a thing between convictions and you may have a conviction I don't have and I may have a conviction you don't have. But how many of you know the word of God, there's no discussion on certain matters, what we call the absolutes of scripture. I think the only way to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not my conviction. That is the word of God. So, I'm not just putting a conviction on you. That's what the word says, okay? We don't have discussions on that. I don't know this pastor. He didn't give me his name, and I'm glad. I don't want to know his name. But I can tell you this. When you are a man of God, supposed to be a man of God, that has been through Bible school, and the Bible is your rule of life, and you get offended because someone brings the word, you are an offended person. You're offended. A defiled conscience then leads to deception. A defiled conscience will lead to deception. And then these are just fruits that can come. And then sin and iniquity starts to abound. Holiness will begin to go from you because it's the word that gives us life. Confusion sets in. Can't make up your mind. Not sure what to do. I don't know what to do. I'm just so confused. The Bible says where there's confusion, there's every evil work. And James is the one that deals, yeah. repent of being double-minded. Well, how, how is it that we're double-minded? Because the word of God is no longer ours. We, we are emotionally driven. There's a lot of emotional arguments going on right now. So I'm learning something. I'm, constant, I'm a learner. I will learn till the day I go to be with the Lord. So 
Let me try to close up. So we're doing some training right now. I'm going through Christ-like dialogue. This book is awesome. Engaging in conversations that honor God. And Ty and Drew came in and started doing the training. So I'm going through it. And we've had it in the locker room back here about, because one thing, I want to do everything I can to not offend someone because of me. And then at the same time, I'm going through this book, What Would Jesus Say? This is Tony Book. Tony Cook just wrote this about the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Well, how many of you know Jesus said some strong, strong stuff? Strong stuff. And I'm looking at these and I'm going, Lord? And all of a sudden the Lord said, start speaking to me. He goes, what causes the problem is when your heart is offended or other people's hearts are offended. Because what we do is we, we start managing everybody. Well, we can't talk about that because that offends them. Well, does it offend them because that part of the Word of God is offensive or does it offend them because they're offended? Are you following me on that? We can't cover everything we need to do, but here's what I want to do. Listen, offense is deadly. It is dangerous. And here's what I've been doing. I've been taking the opportunity for all the times that people say things that I feel like are not fair. I feel like they're, they're not accurate. They're not truthful about me, about the church, about whatever. I take that as my opportunity to go to the next level. Thank you for that overwhelming response because you can go to the next level, church. When you, when you have all these things that are, we're in a highly charged time with all of these political issues that are going on. You say one thing the wrong way and bam, it goes off. Is it what's being said causing the problem or because we're full of offended people in America? We're full of offended people in the greatest nation in the earth. And the, the, the responsibility goes back to the body of Christ. We're no longer salt. We're no longer light. The church is more offended in some cases than the rest of the world. The world has done better with offense than sometimes the church has. And it feels like I opened this can up just enough to leave it half-baked. <laughs> so we'll just try to go to the next part of this and the next service and the next service. But I do want to pray this. You are his sheep. I'm praying that you will take hold of the word of God and not be one of those that are offended. Jesus warned us, offenses are coming. And he told John the Baptist, he had to tell him, John, blessed are those that are not offended in me. Offended in what? The word. The word is the only thing that's going to get us out of this. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray. As you are raising up a glorious church, Lord, the shaking that is going on, that, Father, we will get to the place where we can no longer be shaken. We ask in Jesus' name, Father God, that we will allow you into those wounded, broken places of our hearts so that you can bring healing. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Thanks for joining us today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus or you still want to, please call the number on the screen. We would love to be in this journey with you. We want to pray with you and we have a gift for you as well. If you enjoyed this message or you would like to watch previous messages, please check us out on the CFAN app, or you can also check out our YouTube channel. You can like and subscribe so you always get updated with notifications for new content and new messages from CFAN. We love you so much. Have an awesome week.